Okay. Uh, um, thank why you. don't I open up the meeting? Um, okay. This is Senate Appropriations Committee, and uh, we are going to have testimony related to the Vermont State College um, study uh, that has been submitted and obviously has some very significant budgetary um, connections. So um, with that, I would like to ask um, Senator Baruth to introduce our witness and any background that he wants to provide the committee um, as we um, focus on this particular area of uh, budgetary um, need. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, to refresh people's memories who might be on YouTube, um, Ex-Chancellor Spaulding, some months back, made a proposal to close three campuses of the state colleges. There was universal outcry and uh, the leadership of the House and the Senate and the money committees in both chambers stepped in and um, helped through that crisis with uh, bridging funds and also the creation of a select committee on higher education. The select committee was structured in a very particular way with a steering group. And that steering group's first job was to hire, put out an RPF and, um, uh, or RFP and hire a consulting group. Um, and they found NCHEMS, uh, a great, great group with a great record. And Brian Prescott is with us. Where we stand right now in the process um, just to, to um, cut to the chase, is NCHEMS has drafted a report which the select committee has been through twice now. We approved it for release on December 4th. We've now been through an update, um, but I believe the version that the committee has is the December 4th version. Um, but uh, the only thing I'll say before Brian starts is that uh, the the very first thing we did was to try to define the state's needs um, and, and what it seeks in return for the investment it makes. And among those things, we determined that we wanted the presence of a state college, an institution of higher education in every region of the state, i.e. we were um, recommending that these three campuses not be closed. Although, uh, as you'll see from the presentation, there's a recommendation to reduce the footprint and the administrative uh, bureaucracy, et cetera, but trying to keep the Northeast Kingdom online with a physical presence as well as Randolph Center. Um, so with that said, uh, I'll turn it over to Brian Prescott, who I believe is vice president of NCHEMS uh, to go through the report. Thank you. Do you just Thank wanna you. Uh, introduce yourself for the record, Mr. Prescott? Sure. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. I, I have routine problems with uh, being heard on Zoom um, and also in my household sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> uh, my, my name is Brian Prescott. I'm, a, I'm the vice president for the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, better known as INCHIMS. Um, and we are a uh, nonprofit 501c3 small organization located in Boulder, Colorado. And we, uh, by way of a little bit more introduction, we've been involved in statewide strategic engagements around post-secondary education at some point or other in pretty much every state in the country. And in recent years, we've been uh, helping some other states try to address problems that are not dissimilar to the ones that are uh, being confronted in Vermont. And so we are pleased to be the consultant that was selected to help the select committee do its work. And um, thank you for the introduction, Senator Ruth and for, the, for your engagement throughout the process so far in the development of this work. Um, I would say my instructions are to try to outline what was in the December report briefly and leave time for questions. And I'll do my best to do that. Um, by way of uh, a little bit more process, um, I would say the December 4th report that you have um, was the one that we created with considerable involvement from the select committee and the steering group of the select committee. Um, it, it was also informed by uh, a pretty um, extensive analysis of available data, both publicly available and data supplied by the uh, chancellor's office 
as well as from UVM and VSAC. Um, and we have also, uh, with the help of the New England Board of Higher Education, been involved in pretty extensive stakeholder engagement activities with the unions, with members of uh, concerned uh, interest groups and communities, uh, and so forth. We have consulted reports and studies that are relevant, most especially the treasurer's report and the report produced by Jim Cage, which I think you all are all familiar with, but also the work that was done by organizations like Indy Thrive, the board itself, and BCSC Thrive. Sorry, Indy Strong. Um, and then as I mentioned, we've worked intensively with the select committee to develop the recommendations, as well as the criteria for solutions that uh, I'm here to sort of provide an overview of with you today. Um, the December re report is just the first of three where we are uh, required or the select committee is required to produce. Uh, the next one will be a refinement of that report and Senator Bruce referenced uh, adjustments that we are still working on with the select committee in advance of that next report, which is due in, in February, mid-February, and then a final report due in April. So it's been a whirlwind process for everyone involved, not least of all me, but uh, we've been pleased to, as I said, pleased to be involved in it. The conclusions that I think all of the work that we've, the, the analysis that we did um, leads to, you know, a, a not surprising conclusion that transformation is critical and urgent, uh, and that in order to be, uh, for it to take hold and be successful, there will be a substantial requirement for state support. Um, if you'll for, um, indulge me, I, uh, I, I will be referencing um, a little of the document on my other screen as we, as we talk, um, if I can figure out which one I'm looking for right now. Um, and so in the report that we provided, there's a, a, well, the report that we are continuing to work on, I'll just preview just real briefly. There's a, a growing uh, sense of, of what we need to provide in terms of the case for urgency. Uh, it's likely that, the, that without action by, substantial action by the legislature, uh, the situation that has uh, been rooted in many years of, uh, of, of issues, not just the pandemic, um, is likely to worsen. A closure of any one of these campuses carries substantial costs. Uh, and not only do, does it carry, it carries actual direct costs of closing the campus, of, of, uh, of dealing with the students that are currently enrolled and what happens to them. Of, um, there's, a, there's an expectation that you would presumably sell the real estate that's available, but that won't happen immediately. And in the meantime, there will be cons considerable closing costs. Uh, all of this uh, estimates that we've been able to determine um, is, is significant enough that it may account for roughly one sixth of the total system wide budget in the most optimistic scenario and considerably more beyond that. If you also account for the fact that letting a uh, closing a campus likely means the loss of revenue from tuition and other services provided in the process. So there's a real clear need to, to act. And I think that's one of the things you'll like to see uh, in the next version of the report that we'll release and uh, that the select committee will put forward in February. Um, Senator Bruth mentioned criteria for the students in the state. I'll just outline some of the ones that are in the report that the, the select committee has come up with at, through a pretty thoughtful and, and, and engaged process. Um, the idea that the state colleges should become more student-centered, that the solution should address the um, sort of persistent affordability concerns that exist in the state and in this uh, state colleges in particular, that the results should lead to greater access to workforce relevant programs for all types of students, including adults located uh, throughout the state. Um, and that those, uh, those type, type of programs aren't just pro, you know, separate programs, but they involve the, um, the uh, creation of more workforce relevant skills development and experiential opportunities, even for the liberal arts programs that are uh, present on, uh, in, in, in BCS institutions already. Ultimately, it should uh, result in fiscal sustainability and rely, it will rely, need to rely on greater coordination and collaboration 
in both the academic and the administrative functional areas of the state of the system. And uh, so uh, that's the set of criteria that led the select committee to adopt recommendations and put forward recommendations that you've seen in the December report. And I'll go into those real quickly. Uh, the first one is around restructuring. And under that recommendation, the uh, select committee has argued that the community college of Vermont um, be maintained as a separate institution focused on sub baccalaureate programming. Let me back up a second. This restructuring should really uh, have as a starting point the idea that the institutions that that uh, emerge from this restructuring will have be assigned clear and relatively distinct uh, mission statements that they are able to follow. Um, so the part of that would be that the Community College of Vermont would focus exclusively on sub baccalaureate programming, expanded to have a greater focus on workforce relevant education and training and services to adult learners in particular, including non-credit programming. The remaining three institutions, Castleton, Northern Vermont, and Vermont Tech, uh, would be unified into a single, singly accredited organization with a single leadership structure, and in the process serving a mission to provide affordable and accessible baccalaureate level education, limited master's programming in level programming in areas where the need for such programs is geologic, geographically dispersed. So you need teachers in all throughout the state and you uh, are likeliest to find them among the populations that already live there. So providing a master's program in education to uh, Southeastern Vermont, let's say, is a sensible thing for an institution to, uh, that has a support for in, in, in the North, Northeast Kingdom should provide. And if, in addition, some limited technical sub baccalaureate uh, credentials, such as the pipe that Vermont Tech already provides uh, in, in partnership with CCV as a way to um, create greater efficiencies there. Um, the restructuring would include uh, improvements in administrative coordination and the sharing, in particular, the sharing of academic programs. One of the key uh, um, changes that, I, that, the, that the system uh, is being encouraged to pursue is the idea that uh, as the enrollment levels have declined and fiscal um, conditions have declined, the institutions and some of their departments have shrunk to the point where quality becomes an issue. Part of the solution to addressing the need for providing access to quality programs involves the sharing of academic programs across these, what are currently independent institutions, uh, via a, a mixture of program modalities, whether that's some online instruction, some mixed with some face-to-face -face instruction with adequate student support uh, programs, as well as some other more innovative uh, approaches like um, uh, periodic on-campus uh, experiences, limited residency, that kind of thing. And so that, that will be a significant change and one that, um, that the institutions are likely to need to do regardless. Um, and we think that it makes the most sense and is the most efficient um, strategy to coordinate that across a singly accredited institution where the leadership structure can, can make those uh, changes more um, aggressively and, and help them stick. That's the first recommendation. The second recommendation oh. relates, sure. Okay, I just wanna, uh, regarding first recommendation, any questions or comments before we move on? No, okay, I, I just wanted to ask, um, to do a single accreditation, are there fiscal advantages to that as well? Um, we believe uh, that, that coordinate, yes, we believe that, that putting the, in, in the longer term, putting the institutions together will have some cost savings and we have some, some evidence from other institutional consolidations that suggest that is, that, is, that is likely the case. Now, whether they turn into actual savings or reinvestment opportunities. Right, well, success, sure, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. understand that. Um, okay. All right, thank you. Um, and it, that, which is not to say that it doesn't come without costs or, or without challenges, right? I mean, it would, it would, it would take some time. It would, it would have some costs in terms of trying to uh, create the project infrastructure to, to move that 
effort forward, which is why in the third recommendation, we talk about the need for the state to help support and stimulate the transformational activities that are needed. The other questions, yes. Oh, yeah, back in, yep, Senator Ballant. Yeah, hi. Um, in terms of um, the section C talking about um, really trying to serve students of all different types, including working adults um, and un underrepresented you know, population. I'm wondering to what extent did you look at how incumbent workers, working adults right now as a student population, what's the, what's the percentage of those students on the campuses now? Um, I'm just wondering when you talk about expanding, do you have a, have you thought about a target for what what that population would look like in order to make it financially feasible? Yes, we uh, we have talked a little bit about that. And um, huh. so let me let me take this sort of in in some kind of sense, hopefully sensible order. The, um, the the proportion of student enrollments among adults is largest at at CCV, and to a slightly lesser extent Vermont Tech. But among the other institutions. Uh, there is, there is much more predominantly a traditional age student population direct from high school residentially based um, uh, students. And um, the Vermont Tech and to, I think to a lesser extent CCV, they, they also have, they also offer programs or they coordinate services for adults in the workforce right now that are not captured in most data. And in fact, Vermont, my, our sense of, of Vermont is that there is not a clear sense of the degree to which non-credit and, and customizable training programs and other things like that are actually being carried out throughout the state because it's um, so heavily decentralized and not particularly well funded. So um, we are continuing to try to gather information and, and refine recommendations around that particular area. But we do think that, the, that Vermont, between Vermont Tech and CCB, there's a real need for um, uh, real attention to, and in expanded some, there is already some, but an expanded attention to reaching that population of individuals. Now on the last point, the last question you had, um, we do have some, some, uh, some data in the report that probably makes sense to, this, to discuss under that third recommendation that suggests there would be some additional tuition revenue to be reaped from better outreach to populations not currently being well served, uh, but with the data being what it what they are, it's what we've done is we've tried to say it's not, it wouldn't take an awful lot of additional outreach to generate some tuition revenue to help close some of those structural deficits that come, the system is experiencing. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, so we'll go on to recommendation uh, number two, I guess. That's where we stopped. The second recommendation, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the second recommendation is to, uh, that the system should move aggressively to coordinate administrative service operations. Uh, this is a, an area where I don't think that there's really uh, any, um, there's likely to be really a disagreement from various uh, sources that, that more efficiency can be gained on the administrative side within the system. Uh, uh, itself and the even the, the the labor task force has suggested improvements in that regard um, the the points of disagreement is how to actually carry that out and in our case we've argued that it's not and i think this has so far been somewhat of a misperception of the recommendation that the select committee has put forward we are not advocating for a substantial increase in the chancellor's office size we are, however, recommending that the chancellor's office move aggressively forward with the support of the board to ensure that that, uh, that process um, gets, the, gets rolling and, and proceeds speedily. The coordination of, the, of administrative services does not, have, does not necessarily mean centralizing all those functions uh, with it under the leadership of the chancellor in um, an office in Montpelier. It need, it, instead, it means that, the, for example, a function like financial aid services, the policies and procedures to be um, used around making sure that compliance is sorted out, that students get their funds, et cetera, can be, 
coordinated and if expertise exists at Castleton to carry that task out and to, to create the leadership for how that gets done, then that can happen at Castleton. Mm -hmm. Students at NVU will still need access to a financial aid counselor. Now they can get that through online engagements where there's a person in an office in Linden and in Johnson to actually meet with students about their financial aid needs. But that person is a, is, is a uh, frontline individual. They're not creating policy or implementing policy in a different way from what's going on across the system. And that same approach can be used across a, an array of administrative services, generally speaking. Um, I think that it's fair to say that the board, my, our experience is that the board and the chancellor's office is moving forward in some areas with regard to that. Um, they have to, and it, it's, it's going, there's, it's not, all, it's not easy to do it. Um, they did it around payroll. I think last year that did not proceed smoothly. So <laughs> one of the key elements we're talking about here is the real need for effective and professional project management. There are really, I think, high quality people in the chancellor's office and scattered around the system, uh, but they have many, many tasks on hand and they're not necessarily trained project management folks. So we're arguing that, that in order to get better outcomes and better transformation, there needs to be um, resources to support the, the acquisition of, of really good project management services to carry out these kinds of consolidations. Okay. Any questions That's on that one? Recommendation number two. Yes. Okay. Um, Senator Ballant. Not so much a question as a comment. I think it's really unfortunate that the, the consolidation of the payroll went so, so roughly because it just didn't instill a lot of confidence about additional um, consolidation of services going forward. I just want to sort of state the obvious that, that we're not building on something that works smoothly and there's still a lot of hard feelings around that. So mm -hmm. it's a challenge. Um, I, on the yeah. other hand, we know, or at least I know from um, faculty in my area that they, they add, um, the, um, there was a lot of um, animosity toward the chancellor's office and, um, uh, you know, just get rid of it, save money, give it all back to us make the world go back, et cetera. So in some ways, this um, uh, proposal to look at this more distributive kind of administrative um, function, uh, assuming that where it's lodged can implement it well across the system um, uh, helps kind of mitigate that, um, that those feelings that the chancellor's office and administration is mm -hmm. growing and um, at our expense, which I'm sure you picked up, but it was certainly a very strong um, message that we were, for those of us who live in the areas where these colleges are located, we're certainly um, hearing. And our sense is that, that, the, that project management activities, it sounds basic, right? But it, it really requires a unique set of skills and capacities that, um, that are not necessarily, they're not, they, they're, they can be kind of uncommon, and it and and it, they're not they're not necessarily going to be something that somebody can take on the side of, a, of an existing full time array of jobs. So it is a a cost to try to help transform the system. To in 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 order to coordinate these administrative functions, there's a cost associated with doing that effectively and well, and in a way that sort of addresses the concerns that the payroll experience. Um, created. Okay. So uh, if no more questions, we'll go on to recommend the next recommendation. The third recommendation is uh, probably the one that, that you're, as appropriators, you're most interested in. This is the one that talks about um, strategic funding of the system overall. And, uh, and it, and it, includes um, the substantial additional ask for funding resources to the to support the transformational activity outlined in this report that, that start to be outlined in this report and for which there will be more work to be done as this uh, select committee continues this work but also we should be mindful and this is an area where we at entrance are, are trying to be clear but also members of the select committee that the job of the board 
is, is really where a lot of this work is gonna get carried out. Excuse me, in the chancellor's office or um, at the direction of the board. And so um, what's clear is that there's, that, that, the, uh, that the, the opportunity to create this change is, is, is clear and present, that the pandemic has created a whole bunch of additional costs uh, and of course, the, the legislature has been generous in trying to help the, the system sort of manage the current fiscal year uh, with help from the, from the um, CARES Act. But as it goes forward to try to put um, the system on good financial footing, there is a, a timeline. This isn't gonna happen overnight. And the idea that's represented in this transformation is that this, the legislature um, or the state would provide substantial additional resources in the upcoming fiscal year. And I'm quite aware that the state budget, uh, state budget situation that, that you all are gonna have to be wrestling with as, as you go forward. Um, but that, the, that funding support to, 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 to allow for this transformation to happen will be required. And the way in which the, the, um, the, the sort of the ask is structured is that there's more uh, money requested on the front end and as, as the system is able to find cost savings or savings they can redirect towards improved affordability, um, you, the, the subsequent years, the, the money requested from the legislature would go down. Um, paired with this, I should probably mention, is this idea that we have not found a clear and uh, clear articulation of what the state wants out of its state college system the select committee has done a bunch of work to sort of outline that. That's sort of in the criteria, sort of mixed into the criteria for recommendations. But in order to know what you're paying for, uh, it, 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 lacking a, a clear awareness exactly of what you're paying for has sort of led to a, a sort of, we're gonna provide $30 million a year to the state colleges and hopefully we'll go forward from that, but tuitions have generally gone up. So we, we, in addition to the transformational request, there is a request to provide some additional funds to support affordability concerns. As I think you probably all are all aware, Vermont is the, um, the, the state in the union that is far and away the, expects the most uh, funding support for its public institutions to come from tuition revenue than any other in the country. I thought New Hampshire was um, be worse. It's, it's it's now it's like 87 percent for Vermont and about 82 or somewhere between 80 and 82 or thereabouts for New Hampshire. But you okay. all are sort of in regular. I know. I know. I always, used to get a little consolation. That we, were, we were really bad, but our neighbor to the east. OK, can, can I just point yes. out that? Uh, uh, yes. Two Bill things. Bruce. First uh -huh. of all, we have the lowest birth rate in the nation, except for New Hampshire. Um, so we got that going for us. Um, and then the second thing is, I spoke with Senator Campion about, you'll see in the report to connect with what Brian just said, it asks that uh, essentially we draft some language for Title 16 that lays out what the state wants from its uh, mm -hmm. state college system. And uh, Brian seemed um, receptive to that. So as the committee puts together um, kind of final report recommendations. I told Brian that I'll, I'll bring those ideas to him. And um, I don't think Brian that anybody anticipates a lot, but maybe a, where there are now two paragraphs, maybe a page and a half of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, guidance. Okay. Um, uh, one of the, um, you had used the, uh, and looking at the system where in fact efficiencies that then free up money that can be reinvested or help support the transformation. Um, what about on the, um, well, setting aside tuition um, increases, um, other ways of looking at uh, uh, revenue generation. And um, the example is we have a very aggressive Southern New Hampshire University and they actually have gone into Vermont high schools. They're credentialing Vermont teachers and they are you know, moving very quickly. And of course, those students are the ones that you wanna create the pipeline or 
um, um, if in fact we want to make um, uh, make uh, a better pipeline, so to speak, to our state college system. Did um, did that come up in your deliberations in the extent to which um, maybe the state college system's lunch is being eaten because of this very aggressive, um, uh, you know, a, a academic entity um, that is right at our doorstep and in fact has gone in and marketed services to our own um, uh, high schools. So when we're using public resources at one level that in fact um, might work at cross purposes for um, the support of higher education. I, I just was wondering if that was part of your examination. Yeah, I think that we, we didn't spend a ton of time on the, the, the competitive um, environment that the state colleges are in because it's well understood that that kind of behavior from Southern New Hampshire is happening, but it's not just them, it's, it's a whole array. I mean, the, the part of the country that you're in is is saturated with, oh, with, yeah. with, with yeah. institutions. They're all facing the same demographic picture. And uh, a few of them have thought, figured out how to, tie, to try to transform themselves in ways that are in keeping with the kind of um, academic uh, programs and opportunities that um, appeal to the populations that are there, including adults. So the idea that the Vermont State Colleges can carry on as they have been uh, serving primarily, not exclusively, but at least at NVU and Castleton, primarily uh, residential traditional age students from a dwindling pool in an increasingly populated market do, with, with, with a wide array of programs that are duplicative doesn't work. And increasingly there needs to be a, um, a, an approach that is more contemporary and competitive that involves, I think, the um, leveraging of the, the good resources that exist in new ways across the, the enterprise, including um, you know, programs that are offered in theater or meteorology at Linden that can be um, consumed by students attending at Castleton or whatever. Um, and the key is to ensure that, those, that, those, that that's set up in a way that works, uh, but creating the transformative change that is going to be difficult. And in SNHU is not going away. Uh, no, no. So. Mm. Okay, it's Senator Starr. Yeah, <clears throat> seeing that we fund um, our high schools and our public education schools very, um, very well, maybe we could incentivize our high schools by if they send X number of students to the state college system, they get an extra percentage of some type in state aid so that our money that we push to them will come back to us in the state college system as students. Uh, you know, I think we ought to put a little muscle on them if Southern uh, New Hampshire can go in and pick up students and they aren't putting in any money into the high school. We ought to be able to muscle our way in and seeing we're giving them this money. We ought to in increase their efforts in putting, sending their students to our state college system. Well, I, think it, well, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. We might get some uh, some pushback from UVM, who would want to be in on the deal, but well, let them in too. I think that would yeah. be fair. Okay, so um, other. I, I'm just looking. I don't see any other hands. I, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Sears. Yeah, I've been pretty, pretty silent um, today. Well, I, are you okay? <laughs> Oh, oh no, I'm fine. I'm I just, uh, it's just trying to be silent and I not see. say something about everything. But I just can't keep my mouth shut the entire meeting. Um, I get, you know, and maybe it's been covered in the discussion, but it, it worries me about the state of public, uh, the state of college or higher education in this nation, not just at. Um, uh, 
state university, the uh, state college system, but throughout the nation, you, and particularly here in the Northeast. I mean, I, we lost Southern Vermont College here in Bennington. We, um, and are we are we rescuing something that is, unless it completely transforms itself, is not going to be the you know the 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 Southern New Hampshire University I see advertised all the time on television down here. Um, the North Adams State, what used to be North Adams State, now it's the North Adams I think, College of Liberal Arts. Those are drawing a lot of my constituents, kids. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if, you know, what is the outlook for higher education in some of these smaller schools? And I'm seeing so many of them, they're all private uh, to be sure, um, but we've seen so many of them close around New England. It's not just a Vermont problem. And, and I understand that we've under, that we can talk about the little bit that we put towards that, the whatever, the, 89% of the funding has to come from other sources than the state. But even if it was changed to 75%, um, is it is it gonna work? I guess that's my question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, presuming that's addressed to me. Um, yes, I, I think I, it probably is. Yeah, fine. yeah. Um, I think that, uh, that that it's it's a it's a it's a good question. The answer to it, I would say, is that with the limited access, with limited data that we are able to access, um, the the graduates of the Vermont State College system uh, are generally coming from Vermont in much larger numbers than students attending UVM or otherwise. And they're more likely to stay in Vermont than graduates from UVM or Middle Valley or whatever. Um, they're also, they also tend to be the students who are uh, more marginal in terms of the degree to which they're likely to enroll uh, direct from high school or as adults. UVM is a quality institution, but it serves um, uh, uh, generally a much more uh, traditionally a student population from around the region and across the nation. Um, BSC, Northern Vermont University, serves students who likely would not attend college in the absence of having uh, a presence up there in that in the Northeast Kingdom, which is why um, we've encouraged the, the, the select committee, and I think that it didn't re require a ton of encouragement on our part to, um, ensure that one of the criteria is that students from all parts of the state are able to access right. um, a, a quality uh, higher education experience. And when you have a presence that a state assets is already there, the question I think the, the obvious thing to do is to try to leverage it the most effective way. Um, 20 or 30 years from now, I would expect that if you rescue these institutions, they will, they will, be thrive, they will remain as thriving institutions. Um, I think that there's more work in our report to be done on how these institutions are uh, economic engines of their communities beyond just being employment centers. Um, but together with UVM and other state investments help to bring um, individuals back into Vermont who might otherwise be leaving the state. Uh, that's a really tough task that's maybe on the on the marginal edges of the select committee's charge. But I think that it goes hand in hand with the uh, criteria that they've laid out that says we, you know, a presence in these places is important. And it's important not just because they are often the biggest employer in the area paying the, you know, the best wage or paying above average wages. Uh, we actually, there's actually an intent to try to, to leverage these institutions for, for, um, you know, and, they, and I think it's fair to say that they, in, in, in making these statements, I don't want to imply that they aren't an, an economic multiplier. They are, but I think that they are the key, uh, or at least part of the solution to trying to, to, to uh, change the, the futures. 
And so, uh, but, you know, 45 years from now, it, it's, uh, you know, higher education is certainly undergoing a, a, a change driven by places like SNHU, by new technologies. And in fact, what we're, what the select committee's recommendations are, are saying is we ought to, uh, as a set of, of institutions, um, organize ourselves to take advantage of those sim of similar opportunities for outreach, for engagement, and for impact. Um, hey, Senator Sears is thinking ahead, 40 years out. Um, well, I'm not going to be in this position 40 years from now. <laughs> that but remains to be seen. Well, but it's, encar <laughs> no, I'm, it's encouraging to, uh, to hear that you have confidence that they can survive if we can be construed yeah. and they're not going to, that we're not just throwing money um, away. Uh, by trying to um, have a bridge to the future, mm -hmm. um, given what's happened at higher education around the, particularly New England, I, I, I'll just stick with New England right now. Nationwide, the, the so, well, but but it's been more New England, um, smaller colleges closing, and um, the Globe, Boston Globe, did a number of stories about colleges and. Yeah. Um, I think Senator Baruth and then Senator Westman. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to speak to Dick's question quickly and, and then say something about the money side of it. Um, I, I do think Brian makes an excellent point. All the research shows that if people go to school in Vermont, we're likelier to retain them. Um, it's an information economy. So if we're not providing the higher ed, uh, for instance, if we had three campuses closed, people will have to go to get to higher, their higher ed somewhere else. Or they don't will, get it. Right, or they don't get it and they will be lower um, paying jobs that they inhabit if they have jobs at all, or they'll be moving out of state. So we would be compounding the, the problems that we have demographically. In terms of the money, um, I don't want to sugarcoat one piece of the report, and that is there's a table that lays out the, mm -hmm. the projected needs over the next uh, five years. And then later in the report, it calls for the state of Vermont to identify a funding source, a permanent funding source, in addition to what we've been supplying for general fund dollars. Um, and that's how you get to that more sustainable piece. Now that's a, that's a fraught discussion, um, but I, I don't wanna make it seem as though this isn't built on that ground. When we talk about sustainability, where we talk about those three campuses remaining where they are, it presumes that the general fund um, contribution remain at least the same and that there be an identified source added to that. Um, so, the committee in its wisdom could figure out all sorts of ways to get to that, but that's what it's all built on. Okay, and you have, of course, advanced um, the proceeds I, from the sale I wasn't, of America. wasn't gonna say that, but. Oh, but well, I'll, I'll say it for you. <laughs> um, Senator Westman, you had a comment or a question? Yeah. The comment was that um, the student that you described that drive to, to school that um, stayed is exactly where I was almost 40 years ago. And the mission of the school um, um, always centered around that. Um, in the report, um, the feeling in, in some places is that the, the, the system as a whole has drifted away from that. And that drift has put, um, it has put more pressure on the system itself and created less buy-in to the system. And um, we, um, and, and so I hope the report and, the, um, and what comes out in February will put a highlight on how we, as we appropriate money, can um, continue to shine the light on that particular area because that's where 
we need to concentrate our efforts. So how do we put the money in to make sure that that focus remains on that group? We're, um, I, the term social justice came up numerous times as it relates to providing access to Vermont kids who otherwise um, wouldn't have, the, wouldn't really go on to higher education. But all this discussion really brings home how um, compartmentalized in some ways um, uh, our discussions have been relative to higher ed and what it means because we never, we always look at economic development and how we import um, uh, people to the state. Um, and yet, at, and at the same time failing to say, how do we uh, develop and how do we provide the opportunities for the kids that are already here? And how do we um, assure that access um, to the higher ed, whether it, it's a degree or sometimes certification, sort of certificate programs and how to make it affordable. And so I see some of the uh, techniques that fall within the typical economic development sphere totally disconnected from the investments and the value and the role that our um, state colleges should play in that workforce development, in that uh, keeping our, uh, our young people here, um, uh, increasing skills and uh, providing um, that kind of geographic um, access to educational services. And um, when we get into our committees, we get you know the Agency of Commerce and Community Development and they've got their toolbox and it's all focused on employers. And I think we've got to really focus on broadening that discussion that, um, that, that there that there are other, uh, uh, other ways of looking at these challenges to the state, whether it's our demographics or our workforce or whatever, um, and uh, make sure that uh, we're not just sort of myopic about it, which I think, you know, I think maybe back to Senator Westman's comment is uh, the way in which a lot of this has been done. It's not under my committee purview, so. Um, I'm going to focus on the departments or the agencies that, um, you know, are, are are my policy areas, and not think about um, that the kind of the larger systems. So uh, I, I'm hoping that this whole discussion will broaden the perspective around the role of this publicly funded investment in higher education. In fact, has very significant. Um, impacts on the economy and um, and business and you know the well-being of the state which I think historically has perhaps not gotten the attention that it needs so Senator Ballant you had a, your hand up yeah I just I wanted to echo what you just said madam chair it's something I've been thinking about a lot having served on education and also having taught at three different rural uh, k-8 to schools you can identify pretty easily those kids who are gonna graduate from high school and never go on to do any additional training or certification. And, and we have got to do a better job. We do a great job, Senator Bruth, as you well know, we do a great job graduating students with very high rate of graduation, but it's that section of kids who never go on to do anything. And, and we know, as you said, it, it speaks to economic development, it speaks to workforce, but it also speaks to like the health of families in these rural communities when mm -hmm. they don't have a ladder to that next good paying job. And, and I do think Vermont State College is a critical part of that. Back or, to, oh, uh, well, sorry. Uh, Senator Westman, then Senator Baruth. Or, or it's just, they have the ability to do it. They have the, and, um, but they don't have the family behind them that can push them to do it. And because that school it was close, that was my case exactly. And my life is better because um, the Johnson campus was there um, for me in that. So I, I'm interested in putting money in, but I'm interested in making sure that when I put that money in, that's where we laser focus the money. So I'm, I, I really need some help thinking about how do I create that Net, that connection between my money's going in to help those kids 
and help those families move ahead. And I think that ties into Senator Sears and we do it in such a way that we're building uh, future fiscal sustainability and um, not, not simply maintaining uh, sort of the status quo. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of thinking and a lot of work ahead. Senator Baruth, you had another comment? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to Bobby's point because the more I, I think about it, the more sense it makes I, I did a, an event with Senator Ash and the rest of the Chittenden delegation at Milton High School and very big high school. Uh, and we went from group of them to group of them. And we had about 20 minutes with each group. And so I talked to 500 kids that day, I think, a big number of kids. And my first question to all of them was, do you plan to use the dual enrollment mm -hmm. uh, program that the state has set up for you. It's, it's about $5,000 worth of college credits that's basically in the bank for you. All you have to do is ask for it. And zero of them yeah. were, were planning to take advantage of it. But to Bobby's point, if the high school had, had an incentive where sending kids to dual enrollment, sending them to the state colleges accrued to their benefit, all those kids would be hit up mm -hmm. with that proposition. Same way free and reduced lunch, uh, they go aggressively to have people fill out the forms because they get the money um, for that. So I'm gonna talk with uh, Senator Campion about what, what incentives could we provide? That, that could be even a side bill, um, but it seems like a good direction to go. Yeah, it, it, because <laughs> obviously it's not, we put those opportunities in place, but they, they ha the, uh, we haven't been able to realize the full potential um, right. of that. And so um, it, it, to me, it's just another way of connecting back to, that, um, to the, to the uh, state college system. I'm, I'm sh we're kind of off on our own discussions, yeah. Brian. Um, That's okay. do, you have, do you have other um, um, information? I don't, the, uh, we got to recommendation three. And yes. then you really stimulated a lot of conversation. So well, sometimes I, think, I do. <laughs> uh, um, do you have other um, other presentation for us or testimony? You, you know, that's the. I think that's the core of what I wanted to say. I, I would go back and echo Senator Baruch's uh, uh, encouragement from about ten minutes ago that um, if there are questions regarding the schedule of payments that we that we included in the report, which I think Chrissy can put on the screen if that's helpful. Um, you know, I want to make sure that any that you, if you have any questions uh, about that, then um, I answer them. But this pretty this illustrates that you know that there's a structural deficit at the Vermont State Colleges that it's substantial and it's grown. A big chunk of it is largely due to costs incurred from COVID. But even after that, there remains a substantial structural deficit that's, that's far larger than it was even a couple of fiscal years ago. And that this table suggests that the, the transformational experience that BSC needs to um, embark upon is going to yield reductions. We have, we've, we've guesstimated that it's possible to, to, to create reductions of $5 million per year over the next several years until the structural deficit is eliminated with the help of funding from the state, that's pretty significant. Um, and, it, and to Senator um, Westman's point a little bit, um, we did talk uh, about the need to address the, um, the, the, the size of the physical footprint at the Vermont State Colleges, there are a number of uh, buildings that are mm -hmm. uh, that are largely uh, um, underutilized or they're obsolete. Renovating them is is not likely to yield uh, additional revenue and come at some cost. So they're un unlike most capital expenditures. This includes the idea that you get some savings from not having the carrying costs of utilities and securing spaces that are not likely to be effectively used in the future. So we've suggested that some of these savings that the Vermont State Colleges can realize um, relatively quickly is by uh, figuring out which of the buildings they currently own uh, need, may need to be um, eliminated from their inventory, either through uh, removing them altogether 
or leasing them out to some partner as, as Vermont Tech and NBU have been trying to do. But at any rate, there is a, there is a little bit of, of detail about focusing the kind of investment the state's being asked to make here in particular around the physical footprint component of this. And I think that I've heard that, that they're working on that now of divesting of some of that property or, um, so it seems like they're moving quite quickly in that area. Um, okay, um, we've seen this <laughs> summary before and uh, um, um, obviously this is a, gonna be a point of a lot of discussion as we go through the appropriations process. Senator Westman. And I would um, like to say the pinnacle of uh, your success and the investment that you got through the state college system is reflected in your appointment to this committee. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> um, so the new federal um, um, bill that just passed the COVID bill um, directs, um, I think, uh, um, 12 or 14 million to the state colleges and 10 or so to the university. Um, will we have um, some idea of how that affects all of these numbers? I think joint um, fiscal will help us on that. Yeah, well, I, you know, um, yes. So I think that uh, in this table, we've assumed, uh, and I think we put this together while well, we did it in advance of the December meeting when there was no, I don't think there had been any discussion about actual, any meaningful discussion in Congress yeah, about this, actual. Uh, this doesn't include any, at, at the time, the idea was that these numbers would be brought down by any. I'm so not, I'm not, I'm not particularly saying these numbers. I'm saying that if we get further upgrades on this report in February, will that be factored in? It, yeah, I, I, we, we have, I, I have, honestly, I'll be honest, I haven't had time to really look at that, but I think that it makes sense for us to try to, to include that, that information where it's clear enough for us to make sense of it, yes. That was, my understanding was the FY 2020, uh, uh, 2022 numbers were where they are now with the idea that it was dependent on what came from yes. the feds. Right. So, so, those numbers, so they right. do not anticipate that that revenue, right. which can help on the uh, demand on the state side, I think is what right. you're saying. That's exactly what I'm trying to okay. get at. Yeah. All right. Um, other comments or questions? Um, I'm just <laughs> looking. Um, uh, we've, um, it's around three, so I just thought I would Bobby's got a question. Uh, yeah. Okay, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm Bobby. wondering, uh, you know, sometime in the near future, uh, we should uh, talk with Michael um, in, in economic development in regards to the straight uh, state training grants and all that money that he disperses, try to coordinate that with with this to some degree so that the colleges get in on this training uh, as much as possible to help them earn money or our own money, but it would go in a different, uh, a little different form. And I think Michael would, would be very willing to uh, cooperate and try to push that in this direction as long as we got to him soon enough. Well, don't forget, we already went to the Vermont training program um, to look as a potential funding source to match, to uh, support nursing programs that are um, administered uh, through the state college system. So yeah. that's an example of, I think what you're talking about um, to leverage that money. In this case, because we can get the Medicaid match, then it really helps add more into the system. Um, but that, um, well, the that is a, kind of, yeah, well, kind of program is, uh, you know, it, it's just floundering along. I know, uh, I know. And uh, the Vermont training program was created with a real focus on supporting employers. <laughs> and so uh, this is getting back to kind of relooking at 
investments in the system and how we, um, what might have been um, a, a good use 20 years ago, we may want to assess. Other right. comments or questions for Brian or um, Senator Baruth? Uh, before Brian leaves, I just wanted to say, sometimes you hire people and they're not good at their jobs. And Chems has been fantastic, very professional, very nimble. Um, they, as Brian said, they've been operating on three or four fronts simultaneously, public comment, um, mm -hmm. as well as crunching the numbers and, and coming up with the report itself. So um, everybody that I know on the select committee has been extremely pleased with their work. So, yeah. Thanks, that's, Brian. Thank you very much for that. That's good. And we do appreciate your being available to us on really pretty short notice. Um, unless there are other questions, I am going to uh, um, uh, move on and we can let Brian um, back go to back work. to what, whatever <laughs> you were. <laughs> and you're in, you're in Boulder, you said? Well, it's too expensive to live in Boulder for, for people in nonprofits, but uh, I live in Lafayette, not far from Boulder, about eight months. Oh, oh, my, my son was in uh, Fort Collins, which is a little further north. Yes. and. Um, but that whole front range is just, oh. Yep, it's lovely. Yeah, but there's no open prairie left. Not, not very much, no. No, uh, no. And the, and, the, and the traffic to get in and out of the mountains is gradually getting worse. There aren't, there aren't a lot of roads you can put through those, those tiny spaces. No, down through, no. yeah, yeah. And they had that huge washout too through the canyon. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, well, okay, thank you. Um, and committee, um, I just want to touch base uh, tomorrow. Um, thank you, Brian. Bye-bye. Um, thank you, Brian. Um, I, uh, I'll work with Stephanie around how to give us a draft on uh, some, just trying to get some of this stuff cleaned up and resolved and move forward in light of the fact that we aren't getting a budget adjustment anytime this week. There's certain things I think we can just say we want to do it and move it forward. Um, yep. And I know that um, uh, Senator Westman and others have um, raised questions about um, uh, the conversations the treasurer is having and so forth. And, and if Senator Ballant maybe can give us a quick update tomorrow um, as well. Are there other um, um, areas that um, the committee would like to do since we've got this time um, available before we start, you know, before we have the budget adjustment to work on. So it's Senator Baruth. Um, I've still been curious about, I think it's 10 to 30 million in CRF that now with the date extended, there were reconsiderations about where the money would go. Uh, will we, um, will we have a unit on that? somehow? Yeah, we will in terms of uh, what is out there and whether it be reallocated. The other um, um, question is that 127 million that's now going into K through 12 and how mm -hmm. does that fit? Um, mm -hmm. How will that money flow? And ultimately, um, uh, there's no question that there's a desire to uh, uh, use these funds in a way to uh, reduce that nine cent tax rate increase that you know that uh, first letter would suggest. We knew that was the high because it had just assumed the, every budget would go through the way it is, and um, and um, no offsets for some of the CRF money that went in. So uh, we will be taking a look at that um, in terms of whether more of that, with the extension on time, in fact, could be spent for the for uh, K through 12. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, we're going to, um, certainly if there's money uh, that we did not um, obligate in broadband before December 20th, um, I think committees will be discussing um, how the remainder would go out. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of discussion around um, uh, satellite versus, you know, the uh, uh, line extension and that's, that'll probably tie into discussions next door. Um, I, um, I think that we just need to get an update in terms of where we are in terms of uh, what has been allocated. And now with the federal extension for a year, 
um, will give us time to, um, um, to use it um, for the purposes that we allocated it. The other um, um, part, I guess, is the, uh, understanding better the new money coming in and the extent, as I mentioned before, we can use those dollars um, to free up CRF, which are more flexible um, and allow us um, some capacity to use them in um, ways that advance Vermont goals. And the ultimate is uh, we know that we can be using CRF dollars um, for payroll, for corrections and public safety and so forth. So the uh, ultimate method to convert to general fund, which gives us the greatest flexibility is also part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I did see uh, Stephanie was on, but then she left. Um, anyone from joint fiscal, Chrissy, um, there but you? Nope, just me. Well, you're pretty important, so we'll take <laughs> you. Um, so tomorrow, then we'll start at 1.30. After the we, floor. I think we'll be off the floor by then, um, Becca. Oh. I believe so. It's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Will we, be voting, will we be voting on that bill tomorrow? Yes, our expectation is to vote on it, uh, get it through all stages of passage, get it to the governor, so there's no anxiety in the towns about town meeting. So, so I'm, um, then I think what we'll do is we will um, then meet at the fall of the gavel. So if we're done, and it tends to, if it's a little bit later, or a little bit earlier, uh, we'll just let that be controlling. Yeah. Um, anything else for today? Otherwise, um, we'll uh, call it a day. This has been an easier day. I've said.